But what would happen if you looked at all the painful experiences you've gone through, all the hurt you've experienced, all the disappointment you've had? What would happen if you looked at those things and asked yourself, not why did this happen, but what now? Welcome to the Mission Driven Podcast, the show designed to empower, educate, and encourage you to stay focused and committed to your mission. I'm your host, AC Cristales. Let's get ready to roll. Thank you so much for joining me on the Mission Driven Podcast. I'm your host, AC Cristales. Guys, thank you so much for joining in again. For this episode, I have something a little different for you. I'm actually interviewing Rachel Brown, who is an assistant principal in the Garland Independent School District. So listen up as she's dropping a lot of nuggets. And also at the end of this podcast, I have a special surprise for you. Thank you for joining me on the Mission Driven Podcast. This is your host, AC Cristales. And today I have the honor and the privilege to interview my first guest on this podcast. And that is Rachel Brown. How are you doing, Rachel? I'm good. I'm excited to be here. Are you excited to be here? I I'm am. excited that you're excited. So let's just go ahead and get into it real quick. Um, go ahead and just tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, your educational background. Yeah, so um, I am an only child, um, which makes me the best child. Um, of two parents uh, came from a two-parent household. Parents were married until my, my father passed away. Um, and, uh, both of my parents made sure that education was a priority for me. Um, my dad did not have anything higher than a two year degree. Um, and my mother had a bachelor's degree, um, but nothing higher than that. Mm. Um, and so the fact that I have uh, a master's degree and will hopefully be starting my doctorate in 2020, awesome. um, it, it makes me the, uh, the next generation, the best of, of both worlds and um, pulling the legacy up. So, um, you know, in the house, we moved to uh, the Texas, to Texas um, with no family. And so being, again, the only child, I spent a lot of time with my parents. Um, we did almost everything together, but they always instilled um, in me that education was a priority. Um, and that supporting each other was a priority. They didn't miss a, an event um, unless it was absolutely necessary. Um, and up until the day that my father almost passed away, um, he didn't miss any of my children's events. Um, and even though they may not always have known the right answers um, to get me there, they were always there and supportive and at the school, making sure that everything was, was going well um, for me and always made a way to find uh, money <laughs> to pay for that education or um, help me find scholarships. My mom is a master at finding money on the web um, to get education. So, um, yeah, it was never a, a question as to whether I would go to college. Um, it was where and what I wanted to do. And then after I got that bachelor's degree, decided I wanted to be a principal and that master's was the next step. They supported me through that too. So, um, I have a question about that. So, yeah, because I was just thinking about that as you were talking about your, you know, your parents and always you know just being there for you to support you. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, obviously they had some college experience, and so education, like you said, going to college was never a question. But in terms of going after your master's, what was the what was the motivation behind that? Mm -hmm. um, the motivation, and, and actually this was the motivation for getting my, my master's degree too, because I was, you know, I didn't have any schema for that either. Um, it was to help more kids, um, to help more now educators and mm -hmm. leaders who help kids. Sure. Um, that really is my, uh, my passion is uh, kids. Mm -hmm. I, I love being around children from mm -hmm three to 18 um, in a high school, that's just kind of where I get my energy from. And I didn't really figure that out um, until I was in college. Okay. So I um, credit the fact that my parents made it a non-negotiable that I at least go get a bachelor's degree um, to me finding my way as an educator. Mm -hmm. um, so just to kind of go into that a little bit, I went to SMU um, on pretty good scholarship money. Um, it would have taken care of four years. Um, but I decided <laughs> that I was going to change my major because I decided by the end of my college career that I wanted to be an educator. Um, and it took me four and a half years. So that half 
um, on the end of the four cost some money. So I had to get a loan for that. But my other four years have been pretty much completely paid for. That's good. Um, and I was not, and I'll talk about this a little bit too. I was not um, the best student. Mm -hmm. I was not the worst, but I was not in that top 10%. Top 10 I wasn't valedictorian, salutatorian. I wasn't national merit, any of that stuff. And I still pretty much got my college career paid for, my, my bachelor's paid for. Um, but... I also had to work mm -hmm. while I was in school. And one of the jobs that I ended up taking was a work study job um, as a math tutor okay. at a middle school in West Dallas, um, TJ Russ Middle School. Okay. Uh, right, Rusk. Yes, right <laughs> by La Field, Maple, all, Maple Lawn was across the street. Um, and I just knew at that point, and I shared this with avid students that I talked to the other day. I was just motivated by money. Yeah. I was a 19 year old kid. Uh -huh. Most 19 year old kids exactly. are motivated by making money and it paid pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was like $10, $12 an hour. Which and at that time, back in the day, money. You know, $12 yes. back then was like, we're showing our age, by the way. We back, are. Back, we then, are. <laughs> back then, $12 was good. I was going to say, gas may or may not have been a, less than a dollar at that exactly. time, too. 93 cents. Uh, exactly. Something. <laughs> something. Um, but so I was pretty good in math. At that point, I was still an engineering um, major. Um, that was my, my goal at that time. And uh, so I knew I could do, in my mind, I, knew, I was like, I could do 7th and 8th grade math, right? Like, it, yeah, sure, <laughs> I made it sure. out of 7th and 8th grade. And what ended up happening is I went and I became a TOS tutor for these kids at TJ Rusk um, so they could pass their, their eighth grade TOS. And I ended up falling in love with these kids. Um, there was just something about the connection I had with them, um, the way you know I talked to them, the way that they talked to me, the way that we interacted. Um, and we got some stuff done. Um, uh, all, if, if, if I, I'm going to say 100%, I don't remember if it was mm -hmm. really 100%, but the majority of those kids that year were able to pass that TOS test okay. at the end of it, too. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember uh, the assistant principal, and um, it was through communities and schools mm -hmm. that, that I was doing the after school program. The campus manager for that saw me working with the kids and were like, have you ever thought about being a teacher? Mm -hmm. And you know me, again, I, I was motivated by money at that mm -hmm. time. I was like, no, teachers don't get paid. <laughs> uh -uh. I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to be a patent lawyer. Exactly. That's what I really was trying to be okay. um, so that I can pay some bills eventually. Um, and they're like, okay, you know, but I still had a couple years. So I essentially kept working that job. Mm -hmm. I did the after school tutoring. I did the program. Um, long story short, decided I did want to become an educator. So that's when I changed the major um, and ended up having to do another half a year um, because I went from the engineering school to the business school. And there were some classes I just needed to finish. So what was the switch? Um, what was the switch? I mean, what like what made you change? Um, so there was a one of my kids named Sable. I still remember Sable. Sable's probably, how old am I? Uh, Sable's probably... 30 something now and probably has her own family but um at the end of that year um sable had given me just a note and you know mm -hmm. how i am when the kids give me the sure. had given me just a note telling me thank you um miss rachel and i'm gonna miss you and that kind of stuff when she was going to high school and um it really it's fun, it's crazy but that pretty much was it for me along mm -hmm. with the encouragement mm -hmm. um which throughout my career i've been very blessed to have mentors and people who see something in me that I don't mm -hmm. and then push me or drag me mm -hmm. um, to, you know, where I can kind of build on that and become better. Um, and so it was it was both of those. It was my letter from Sable um, and it was um, Mr. Hart. And I can't even remember the assistant principal's name, though, um, who just kind of encouraged me and um, kind of got me into the helping kids business okay. um, at that point in time. Um, and. I had figured out, somebody had told me, hey, because I was like, do I not need a degree in education? Like, how does this work? Mm -hmm. And um, the alternative certification programs were mm -hmm. kind of getting going about that time. And I had read about one at um, University of uh, Texas at Arlington, UTA, okay. where I could also take the classes and they would go towards a master's. Okay. Even though I didn't necessarily know I wanted a master's at that time, I'm always about value added mm -hmm. type of person. For sure, for sure. So I was like, oh, if I can get you know this and then if I decide to get a master's, mm -hmm. these classes go towards it, that's what I'm gonna do rather than having a bunch of classes that don't go towards anything later. Um, and so I went to UTA, got my teaching cert um, certification, once I figured out how much those tests cost, which 
again <laughs> at that time was expensive yeah. i was like oh i can't afford to take these more than once yeah. so i busted my butt yeah. um studying observing figure out figuring out thinking about what my classroom would look like okay. once i got there um, thinking about the type of kids I wanted to work with because I had Sable and I had my TJ Rusk kids who, mm -hmm. um, you know Rusk. Mm -hmm. Everybody might not know Rusk. So, but... Yeah, so tell us a little bit about <laughs> Rusk. <laughs> yeah, and you know now I think it's a, it is a it is a thriving school, but Rusk is a high poverty school. Mm -hmm. um, it is black and brown children, mostly Spanish speaking kids mm -hmm. um, at this place who come from homes that um, are not, you know, uh, full of money and full of books and full of, you know, positive things and neighborhoods that, that can, can be kind of rough to come up in. And so they were traumatized kids. Um, and working with that type of child with a brain that's been traumatized has kind of shaped me into the leader that I am now um, because I wanted to learn about how to still um, do things that will allow that child to learn, even though I started figuring out that their brain had all these other things. For sure going on in it that was trying to stop them from learning mm -hmm. and stop them from being successful um but i always had little pockets of success like sable was one of them um didn't come from a, a great home um should by have all accounts not been successful mm -hmm. um but wanted it she had that motivation and she wanted to do better and she wanted to get out um and that allowed her to kind of at that time looking back and now i know what it was mm -hmm. to kind of push her trauma um, away and um, build some strategies for herself that allowed her to be successful. Um, and so I hope she finished high school. I lost, I kept track of her that next year. Um, and then after that, we kind of lost track uh, of each other, but yeah. um, hopefully she's successful. And that's somewhere. the thing sometimes, you know, that we don't, we don't always see sometimes when I'm speaking I, I tell, you know, really like if you think about it, like kindergarten teachers, right? Like sometimes like, okay, you know, what they're doing doesn't really seem significant, mm -hmm. but it is significant because it, it, it starts from the very beginning, you know, having teachers that care about their students from the very beginning, yeah. you know, giving them that love, giving them that the attention, the, the care, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And stuff that sometimes just kind of gets looked over, you know, yeah. because we're so, you know, data driven, right? Yeah. Things about numbers and whatnot. And so uh, I say that because, yeah, there's there's students that we impact, you know, at the middle school level, elementary school level, and we never really see, you know, what happens with them afterwards, you know? But then, out of the blue, they can come and they can see you somewhere. And they be like, hey, mm -hmm. you were my, you know, you were my teacher, you were my, you know, that tutor in that class. So yeah. that's the beautiful thing, you know? Yeah. So what we're doing is we're planting seeds. Oh, yeah. Bottom line, we're just planting seeds. Yep, and and hoping that they get enough sunshine and water along the For way. Sure. <laughs> For sure, To sprout up, um, you know, because we have to move on, unfortunately, yeah. as well. So everybody starts to move, but... Um, but yeah, that is the hard part about this job is, um, you don't always get to see it, but we both had that experience where mm -hmm. we've had kids, like I've had kids at the state fair, Miss Rachel. And I'm like, who on earth? Cause they mm -hmm. don't, I mean, that's what they used to call me. So when they, depending on what name the kids call me, <laughs> exactly. I can tell <laughs> what stage of life <laughs> and where I was. Yeah. Um, but I've had kids, I've heard Miss Rachel, I've heard Miss Johnson, I've heard Miss Johnson Brown, I've heard Miss Brown called out, you know, um, and they do come back yeah. and the ones who surprise you, um, are the ones who either you had no idea that they were actually listening to what exactly. you said yeah. or the ones that y'all started out so rough and mm -hmm. rocky mm -hmm. that you're like, God, a kid, you know, I know we neither one of us wanted to see each other anymore. <laughs> and then now you're telling me, thank you for sending you to alternative school. Like exactly. what, what is that? Exactly. You know? Um, but you just keep, you keep moving. You got to. Yeah. You, you keep to. plugging away. So. All right. So you were an educator. How long, how long did you teach? Um, I taught uh, for four or five years. Okay. Um, I did one of my years, I was a teacher slash testing coordinator, so I didn't teach a full okay. um, load. And uh, then this this is, been, this is my 11th year in um, administration. Okay, so then you made the jump yeah. to admin. How yeah. was that like? Fast and furious. <laughs> um, so I had, while I was working on my teaching certification, I worked for communities and schools as a campus, I don't remember what my title was, campus manager. So I ran um, anger management groups, got kids food, got the, all, did all that kind of social services stuff while I was getting my teaching certification. Um, then mid-year, the second year that I was with CIS, I actually got hired at 
Dallas Can Academy, um, downtown Dallas. Uh, it was Live Oak at that point, old building, which is now Ross Avenue. Um, and I stayed there for four years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I met my first mentor. Um, then, and he, <laughs> even though I was still teaching and I didn't, you know, didn't really know what I was doing and all of this stuff, he was the one who planted the seed in me that I was going to be in some type of leadership capacity okay. um, in education, just based on, um, I think, the way that I learned to run my classroom. Mm -hmm. I was terrible at first, like most people <laughs> are, um, but how I learned how to run my classroom. And then just, I think he saw how I built those relationships with, again, some of the most traumatized kids um, and um, how I have a systems mind, kind mm -hmm. of. I'm all about how to have a system that is efficient, but that will benefit the most people. Um, and with the, the biggest group of people that needs to benefit are the students. Um, and so I've always been able to look at things and be like, ah, if we do this, if we tweak this a little bit, then it'll kind of run a little bit smoother. Mm -hmm. That I think is what he saw in me because he made me testing coordinator. Okay. Um, and you have to be that kind of detailed, that systematic, mm -hmm. that, you know, focus on organized, uh, right? organized yeah. type sure. stuff. Um, but again, still with the focus on this is about the kids we got to have systems set up that are good and, and allow kids to be successful. Um, and so that's where I started getting some of the leadership. And he would um, invite me to um, curriculum meetings or, again, testing coordinator meetings or um, come over here and listen to this conversation or be part of this, that kind of stuff. What do you think about mm. how we're doing this? Um, so when I um, had my son and had moved out here to Wiley, that drive to East Dallas um, as a new mother became mm -hmm. stressful. Okay. Um, I didn't want to leave Dallas Can Academy because I loved my kids, but I also had a child of my own at that mm -hmm. point that I had to take care of. So um, when we moved over here to Wiley on the east side, it was the craziest thing. We were driving when we had first you know, looked at a house. And I saw a sign that said future Wiley ISD high school. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, oh, I'm thinking in my head, I was like, it'd be kind of cool if I could work at a school that's like two minutes from my house, mm -hmm. legit, um, you know, literally. And um, so fast forward, house got built. Um, they had a job fair mm -hmm. um, and they said that they were looking for high school people for the new high school in Wiley. Mm -hmm. I went to the job fair over at Wiley High School. Mm -hmm. Um, interviewed and pretty much got hired um, <laughs> on that day. I went to the school again later that week to meet with a couple of other people but because um, they were housed at a Wiley High School at that time, but pretty much got the job to be their ESL teacher okay. um, cool. when Wiley East opened. Um, but I talked a lot in that interview and with that principal about my goals at that time to, you know, I'm working on my master's, mm -hmm. you know, I had decided, oh, I need to go ahead and finish this now. I have these hours, had been given tons of confidence by my mentor at Dallas Can Academy um, and just started talking with them about, you know, kind of how I, I envisioned doing things. Mm -hmm. um, and he told me, the second mentor, oh, well, when you get to your internship, let me know. You can help out in the office mm -hmm. um, up at the school and run discipline and learn more about this. And um, he would bring me and several other um, people who were, we were all working on their ma our masters at the same time um, into the office and quiz us on things and tell us about, you know, this and how would you handle this situation if it happened. And um, so that was my um, true indoctrination into, okay, this is what high school or public administration um, at a school would look like. Um, That's good. You know, yeah. A lot of people don't get coaching like no. that. No. Like I'm listening to that. I'm like, hey, I didn't, I didn't have that. You know? <laughs> you know? And like I said, it's one of those things too. Just like a kid, yeah. I didn't realize it until I looked back on it. Mm -hmm. Like this is what, these people were planting seeds in me. Exactly. Um, Definitely. Because they saw something that, yeah. Lord help us. You know, yeah. you know how I am on yeah. most days. I'm like, what? Um, but uh, that's what got it going. And so I was at Wiley East that year, and the summer uh, position came open at Wiley High School. Um, and then honestly, several positions, including intern positions, came open in Garland ISD. Mm -hmm. And I had been fortunate enough to interview in both places. Mm -hmm. um, and I had gone to one of the Garland High Schools for like a walkthrough interview. And honestly, I thought I was gonna get that job, in which I might have, but as soon as I got in the car, um, at Saxe High School, I got a phone call from Wiley High, mm -hmm. um, the principal at Wiley High, saying that they wanted to offer me um, an assistant principal job mm -hmm. um, based on my interview, and um, they really thought I would be a fit for their team. 
And so I left Wiley East reluctantly after that first year um, and went to be a high school AP at Wiley High School. Okay. okay. And that's, man. That's kind of how it got it, got it, it started, is, huh? And it hasn't stopped since. <laughs> um, and so that was the... 2008, 2009 school year? Because I went <clears throat> from Wiley East with those ninth graders over to Wiley High School. So that was also um, actually a blessing to mm -hmm. me. Um, you know this a little bit, Crystal. Like, I like to stay with my kids. Mm -hmm. um, like, even this year, I, I moved with the seventh graders because that relationship piece is so big for me. Being over there with those kids um, for their sophomore year, them having a familiar face moving into a new building and me having some familiar kids to start working with, I think really helped both of us that year. Um, and that's when I really started to um, be more uh, focused on how and why these relationships are important because I could see the fruits of some of my labor the year before mm -hmm. with some of those kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, huh, I felt like I was kind of, you know, fumbling around with stuff, but then started doing some research, going to some trainings on brain, um, based, you know, learning. And, um, I, what the, one of the first ones I went to was, um, uh, worksheets don't grow dendrites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Good Marshall old, Tate. Do Dr. Tate. Like that was the very first <laughs> one. Yeah, and awesome. I remembered sitting in there as a young administrator thinking, Oh my gosh, like there's a name for all the stuff that that, that I we that do. I want to do and that and I that do. do. Yeah, that's a, that, that's another thing. Like I remember, you know, being in that chair. I'm like, man, you know, I do this. I just didn't know it had a name. It had a name, <laughs> and that like people pay for this, exactly. you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Seriously, and so that gave me my next little, you know, push. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm on the right track yeah, here. Sure. This really is going to help these kids. Because, like I said, most days you go in there, you get hit with something that you've never either thought you were going to have to deal with, you've never dealt with before, nor do you want to. And so you feel like you're fumbling in the dark a lot of times and you don't want to mess the kid up, mm -hmm. but you also want to help them find a solution and you want to figure it out. Um, and so knowing that what I was, the path that I was on was actually going to get them somewhere, mm -hmm. um, gave me some, some confidence and was like, Oh, okay, maybe you can do this job, That's you right. know? Um, so, so anyway, what is it, what it, well, I know what you're doing now because yes. here's a little quick quick story. So the way we <laughs> met is um, last last October. In fact, in two Man. weeks, it's le in two weeks, it's going to be a year anniversary where I got a phone call from Garland ISD and they asked if I could, you know, help out at Busty Middle School as an assistant principal. Yeah. And the phone call was like, "Okay, can you can you do the month of November?" And I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> for sure, I can do the month of November." I said, "You know, I, I am teaching on." <laughs> Tuesdays and Thursdays, but uh, if you know if the, if the principal's fine with me not being there Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know I'll do the month of November. Well, then the month of November came. Can you go till Christmas? And then it went. Can you go till spring, spring break? break? And then like, hey, can you just finish off the year? <laughs> but anyways, I say that because that's where I, you know I was able to meet. Um, I was able to meet Rachel and yeah. um, and I had to. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but one of the things that that I enjoyed about you know just being back and um. In a K through twelve school, you know, working at a middle school and you know being there every day was just a, just the relationships that you that you create with people, you know, because now you know I teach at Richland College and higher education is just a different beast. You know, you're just kind of out there on your own. You know, you go, you teach your classes, you make relationships with the students, but as far as you know, talking to other staff, it's very very rare that you do that, especially as an adjunct professor, right? Adjunct, you go, you teach your classes, and bye, you're out of here. So, being at Bussy, you know, just being able to be around people again, I guess, you know, just being around people and just, and just bouncing off ideas, like what you're saying, because I think there's sometimes, you know, there's things that, that, that you do and that I do and that we can learn from each other. And then just like, even being around kids, right? Like, you know, they just, just see different, different types of, um, I don't, I don't want to put it just different types of leadership styles and different types of people. And, and more than that, they see people that care about them. Right. So it's just not Miss Brown saying that she cares about me. It's Mr. Cristalis as well, and I can think of some kids, but we're not going to say because no. of, you know because of <laughs> confidentiality. But I can think of some kids off the top of my head that you know. So they heard the message from you, you know, and they got it in a motherly way, right? Yes. You know, they got it in a motherly way that you care about them, and then they heard it from me, and they got it in my way. But yeah. bottom line, the bottom line with that message was like, hey, we care about you. Yep. You know, and that was that was great. So I'm yeah. sorry, I, I just throw that in That's there. That's okay. But because I I'm, I'm thankful for it, and I'm thankful that you know you're here. We you know we we built that relationship. Because if I would have never got that phone call, 
we wouldn't be sitting here right now having yeah. this conversation. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, we were a team, man. Yeah. Like, you know, it was, it was, we got to get through this for the kids. Yeah. Um, and it was very evident um, to me after we kind of started, you know, get got the introductions, like the first time that I heard you in your office talking to a kid and a parent in English and in Spanish, <laughs> um, that I was like, dude, this dude is saying the same things that I say, exactly. you know, exactly. like essentially it was, it was the same type of thing. And, um, and so I appreciated that because that's always, you know, nerve wracking with what, what's going on when somebody new comes in mid year, it's like, Oh, you know, what, what's the team going to do? What am I going to have to teach them? What, what are we, we're going to have to figure each other out. Um, and I don't remember, it didn't take us very long. It didn't. To... And, and, and that's the thing. And, you know, and I've been in, you know, in administration as long as you, cause I started, yeah. I started in uh no, hold on. Isabella is, I always counted through Isabella. So I started at, at Sellers Middle School in 2006. So okay. it had been, you know, 13 years, you know, obviously, you know, I took my little sabbatical or I've taken my sabbatical or whatnot, right. but yeah, so think about it. You know, since 2006, I've been an administrator, I've been an assistant principal. And when you say that, right, it's always hard just to gauge how you're going to get along with that person that you work with, especially as an assistant principal. Um, what I what I appreciated about you is that there wasn't any competition. We were in it for the kids. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you'll work with an AP with an assistant principal, and it's like they're trying to compete with you. I'm like, hold on, we're, we're in this for the same thing. So, yeah, I definitely hear you with that. You know, you definitely, you, we came in and, you know, of course, I was I was quiet at first because that's that's always how I am, right? I kind of just kind of just fill people up, but then it's like, okay, we're in this for like you said, we're in this for the right reasons, and hey, let's 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 just go and do this teamwork. So. Yeah, yeah, and you know, those children have asked about you. They have. They're like, where's Mister Cristalis? When is he coming back? And where where'd y'all do with him? And you know that kind of stuff. I'm like, oh, so man. I want to get that phone call in two weeks. <laughs> exactly, I know. <laughs> Come back <laughs> like, in October. We need. Come back in November, November first, like last year. <laughs> Like, you got a couple weeks going. Um, so tell us a little bit about your, your job now. One of the things, yeah. of course, with, with this podcast, uh, the reason that I started, because one of the things that I live by, kind of like my mantra is, you know, mission driven. I'm driven by a mission. Mm-hmm. I'm driven by something that, that um, to me, is simple. You know, I want to be the best father I can be, okay? I want to be the best educator I can be. I, I just want to be able to make a difference wherever, wherever, you know, God places me, wherever I'm, you know, I just want to be able just to be a positive force in people's lives. So... In terms of your mission, right? Because everybody has their own mission, their own personal mission, okay? That goes beyond the mission of a school district. That goes beyond the mission of a school. So in terms of your mission and what you do now, you know, and what you're doing now currently, because obviously you've done it, but every year is a different thing, but it, currently what you're doing as an assistant principal, how does how does how how do you see that connect? How does it align? Um, so, you know, like I said a little bit earlier, like I go into it, um, with pretty much the same lens as I did um, when I was tutoring um, at TJ Rusk. Um, I am in this for kids and for their success um, and for their benefit. Um, it may not always be their academic success. I want, I want to make sure that these people, these young people become successful big people, adults. They make it to adulthood. Um, and so that's always been um, my mission as an educator. So when I got into the classroom, I wanted to make sure that my, you know, 150 um, were better than, mm-hmm. than what they were when they came to me. For sure. um, but then when I started learning more about it, then I wanted to, this is kind of maybe where my, uh, my, my greed comes in is because I was like, well, if I can do this with 150, why can't I do it with 250, <laughs> 350? Exactly. How am I going to put myself into a position where I can affect more children? Well, that natural move is up into administration. Mm-hmm. You're over a grade level at that point in time. You're over a campus. Um, and then you can, you know, now after being at the campus level for, you know, 11 years, now I really see um, a little bit more clearly that I need to replicate myself. I can't affect 10 million kids, mm-hmm. sure. but I can help a thousand educators. Definitely. Or a thousand administrators Absolutely. become better by sharing what I have mm-hmm. or training or facilitating or coaching them, which is, you know, like what we were talking about earlier. So now my focus has become over the last couple of years, um, professional development and learning, um, focusing on teacher development and, mm-hmm. and ad- leader development. Mm-hmm. Um, and to the point now that I'm even working with a, a, a company part time where I do go out and I get to coach and train teachers on how to use data that is student-centered 
um, to help them inform their instruction for their kids. Okay. Um, I'm also working with a couple of my um, friends on starting kind of a consulting um, organization. I don't know if we're going to use the word business, but a consulting mm -hmm. firm um, that's going to work on, you know, coaching teachers and administrators um, in public education and in the community sector and possibly nonprofit. Um, I have just really found that helping people become better is what I like to do, mm -hmm. um, especially people who are focused on children mm -hmm. um, in any capacity. So um, that's my mission. Like nice. where the kids are, that's where I want to be. You're, you're in the perfect <laughs> spot, you know, just being in the position that you're in. And mm -hmm. man, I'm glad I'm having this conversation because it's just like we parallel so much. I, and I think you can agree with me on this. So I remember, so I was 24 when I became an assistant principal. I was young, okay, mm -hmm. I was a baby, 24, you mm -hmm. know. And so I felt it's kind of like you were saying, right? And I don't think it's greed in a, in a negative sense. Right. I think it's just more like, man, if I can impact. And I was a bilingual teacher, so I only had like 25, 30 <laughs> students, right? So you yeah. had 150. Uh, but I was like, man, I want to impact more than 25. I want to impact 500, 1,000 or whatever. Uh, but when I first started, it was kind of like, for, at least for me, I had to prove myself, especially for my age, especially because, you know, I was a Latino and, you know, and there's there's still some stigma with that, right? And it's not even about, you know, um, that, well, he got the job because he's bilingual. He got the job because it's, he's Latino. It has nothing to do with that. I got the job because I was the best person for that job. However, you still had people who had the mindset that, well, he only got it because of this. So I felt, okay, and this is just, just foolishly, because, again, I was 24. I felt like I had to prove myself. But something happened. I hit 30. I don't know if there's just something about hitting 30, but I hit 30, right? That was, what, my sixth year. I was entering my sixth year in admin, I was like, I don't have to prove myself anymore. Mm -hmm. And I took on what you just said right now. I said, if I can replicate myself, if I can teach, you know, so-and-so, and if I can help so-and-so become a better teacher and become a better educator, then they're going to be able to impact the kids that I never talked to. Yep. Because you know how it is. As, a, as an administrator, you know, there's only certain kids that you talk to on a consistent basis. And most of the time, especially in middle school, are the students who are, you know, misbehaving. But what about those other students that, you know, we may see in the hallways and we say hi, we never talk to them. However, if I can influence, you know, again, Miss Smith or, you know, Mr. Jones or whoever, and they can have that positive influence, man, it's just like, that's what it's about. So I, when I, when I, you know, like I said, when I turned 30, I was just like, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to prove myself to anybody. Yeah. And I remember I had a teacher who actually told me, he's like, Mr. Stiles, he's like, you know, you're, you're, you're like my mentor. In fact, he called me. I remember when I, when I left, when I, you know, resigned from Sam Houston, he was like, man, he was like, you're my Michael Jordan. And you know, and nice. I like Jordan, right? Yeah. So, so when he said that, I said, like, I felt like, I felt like tearing up. I'm not even gonna lie. So when he said, he's like, you're my Michael Jordan. I was like, man, thank you so much. Right? But, and that's what it's about. And I think, so I, I love what you're doing. I love, you know, just the, the fact that you want to help others because even as a speaker now, right? So I've been speaking full time for, it's gonna be six years of, in February. And, I feel the same way, you know, they're, they're, I love speaking to kids, I love speaking to parents, and I love speaking to educators, and you know, teachers, principals, because again, I know that they, you know, I can do my 45 minute keynote, but they're with the kids every day, Monday through Friday, so they're the ones who, so if I can impact them, you know, through my, through my teachings, or through the knowledge that I have, through my expertise, and they can take it and impact their kids, then it's just, it's just one of those, you know, just a snowball effect, so. I'm definitely, definitely with you on that. Yeah, yeah, that that is it for me. And you know, I, I I'm not sure if you've heard me say this, but I know my close friends have heard me say that one of the hardest things for me about being a secondary administrator is that I can never at big campuses. I've always been at larger schools. Is that I'll never know every single kid's mm -hmm. name. Mm -hmm. Like that literally breaks my heart. Yeah. That there are kids that walk down the hallway in March or mm -hmm. April that I literally, I can't place their face because there's just so many of them. Exactly. Um, and so when I, that that was really, for me, the catalyst to say, okay, but if I know that every single child in this building has one person mm -hmm. that knows their name, that says good morning to them, that checks on them, then that, that's enough for me right now um, moving forward. But I try to learn as many names as I can. For sure. Definitely. And that's, I mean, that's what it's about in building relationships, uh -huh. you know, it's just learning names. So there's a tip right there. Yes. If you're a teacher listening, just learn your students' names. Like, Man. just do that. Take care of that. Well, and too, like, this is, a, if we're talking teacher tips, educators, please 
mandate that your kids learn your name yeah. also. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, so that's one thing that I'll say too. You talked about some parallels, but I think some of the parallels, even though it looks different for both of us, is that we both care about the kids, but we all also all have, have both have expectations Definitely. that we hold the kids to. Um, and we're not afraid to uh, give consequences exactly. um, when those consequences are necessary um, for those students. But um, you know, I, I heard you talking to students before, like my name is Mr. Cristales. I always lead with my name is Rachel, not Rachel, Miss Brown. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what's your name? Um, what, what do you want me to call you? I ask mm-hmm. kids that too. Now, when I was a little bit younger, I didn't like to do the nickname thing, but again, something happens after 30 and I've had multiple <laughs> children now and you know, you fight your battles. Exactly. And so if a kid gives me a nickname that I think is appropriate and that's what, that's what will show them respect mm-hmm. and show them that I'm building that relationship with them. I will call them by that nickname. Mm-hmm. Names are important. Um, you can't teach somebody you don't know. Exactly. Um, and then, you know, after that, learn something about them. Mm-hmm. You know, um, figure out, you know, what they do outside of school or what they like or what they want to be when they grow up. Like, that's the basic. Start there. What awesome. do you want to be? You yeah. know, um, and then go from there. So Awesome. So here's a question. What is your proudest professional moment so far? And I'm, I'm sure you get a lot, but just I do. here we go. With your proudest professional moment. Um, so I thought about this um, before, and it really um, has to be my kiddo who we, this was one of my high school kids, um, who we had had a rough year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we had gone round so this is when and you round. Were at, uh, this was AP when I was yeah at, at, at Wiley school. at mm-hmm. Wiley High School yeah okay. at Wiley High School, and I had a student who um, we had just just rough year. He was going through a lot, um, and we just didn't see eye to eye all the time. Not that it was just terrible. Like I never did anything that I that I you know gr- regret. But I mean, he spent a lot of time out of school mm-hmm. for discipline problems, and eventually. I ended up sending him to the alternative school Mm. and I remember the next school year and he told me, I mean, he just, he did not like me (laughs) at all. And, um, I remember the next school year I saw him at the football game and I was about to get on the radio because I had thought that he wasn't supposed to be there. I'm like, that's how serious this Mm -hmm. situation was. And I was like, I don't think he's supposed to be here. So I was about to get on the radio and he came, I saw him coming towards me too. So I'm like, Oh, what's about to happen? And he came up to me and he was like, Miss Brown, can I can I talk to you for a minute? And I was like, sure. I mean, you know, and um, he was like, I just I really wanted to tell you, um, you saved my life by sending me to alternative school last year. And I'm like, what? Like you? I'm about to tear up. But I was like, okay, stay strong because you got all these kids around. Like, what's going on? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, you know, when I went over there, he said the teachers over there did exactly what you said they were gonna do. Um, it was smaller for me. They worked with me one-on-one. They really cared about me finishing it because here's the other part of this. I knew he was extremely bright. Mm -hmm. Um, like not bright's not even the word. Like he was off the charts intelligent, which is part of why he got in trouble for what he got in trouble for. Yeah, you'll you'll see that. Um, and I would always tell him, you're smarter than this. Why are we making these choices? Like you can, you can do so much better. Um, and he just said when he got over there, he said, you know, they, they did exactly what you said. They, they worked with me. Um, they made sure that I came to school every day. They said good morning to me and they helped me get my credits. Um, and he said, and so, you know, I figured out what I wanted to do. And he was like, and now I'm going to go to Colin, um, and start. And I was like, Oh, what? I mean, that too, just like I said, Sable was my first one to get me going, Mm -hmm. but that one was really the one that I was like, Ooh, (laughs) even the ones who like literally, I mean, there was one day where he was like, I just don't want to see you anymore. And I had told him, yeah, you know, the feelings mutual kid, like we, (laughs) we both are done. Um, and for him to find me and come back and tell me that, that to me, that was pivotal, mm-hmm. um, in my, my leadership, um, uh, journey, okay. I think so. And that's also what kind of solidified for me that kids like him are really the kids that, that I need to be with, mm-hmm. um, because we, we help each other out, mm-hmm. um, Definitely. really. So I have met plenty more children like him mm-hmm. over the years. And you know what? We still go back back and forth. And sometimes they do still get sent to alternative school. But I always make sure um, and tell them, 
hey, you can get out of this. If you do this, then you can get to this next level. When you come back, I'll mm -hmm. be ready for you. Um, I'll be glad to see you um, and we'll keep it moving. And um, so that's kind of, that was one of those moments that's for cool. me. That's yeah. Cool. And, yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, they, they need that. They need, uh, I guess, that, you know, just real, real life. You mm -hmm. know, some, that's how real life works. You know, you do something and, you know, you got con you have consequences. And so, you know, you're doing it because you care about them. Yeah. It may not seem like that at the time, but you, yeah. know, you do care about them. That's exactly right. So you have a platform, right? And, and that's another thing that I talk about in, in uh, one of my episodes that, you know, we all have a platform. You know, when we think of platform, you know. We, we think of well, you know, or you know, whether it's you know social media reach or whatever. But daily, we have a platform. Mm -hmm. You know, our kids. You know, um, we're at our job. So, you have, and I always I always look at it like this because this is another reason why I got into admin. Um, got into administration because I knew that not only could I impact students, but I could impact teachers and parents as well. So, you have your platform, mm -hmm. right? Assistant principal, Rachel Brown. <laughs> so, what what are some things that you feel is important to share? You know, so let's let's just do this. So important to share to teachers. Yeah. Important to share to students and important to share to parents. Great. Um, so I'll start with teachers because I'm working right now with a group of our zero year teachers okay. um, at at Bussy this year. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm working with them and their mentors and that kind of stuff. And um, for I, I just had a conversation with them because we're in October October's a rough month. Mm -hmm. This is where all the kids are showing their true colors. You're a little bit tired now. The is newness, that why they called me in October? They probably, <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it was. Um, the newness of the school year, the newness of your job as a zero-year teacher, oh. as reality has set, and there will be tears in mm -hmm. October, um, mm -hmm. always. And so um, I just told them that when you get to that point, to always force yourself some days to find something that's positive. Okay. Um, we talked this last time about the 80-20 rule. If 80% of your students are able to be successful in whatever system you have set up or on whatever assessment that you've given, um, then that is considered an overall success. Mm -hmm. um, if 20% or more than 20% of your kids are not successful, cannot comply, are not able to do what you're asking them to do, then you need to be introspective and look at how you set that up because it's not working for the kids. Um, and so I told them, let's look at your numbers because again, everything's about data mm -hmm. now. So I had them go look at their discipline referrals and the, the students that they're writing discipline mm -hmm. referrals on because that's what they tend to focus on, those ones that they're writing referrals mm -hmm. on. Um, and then we came back and I checked in with a couple of them. So did any of y'all have more than 20% of your classes that you were writing referrals on? Mm -hmm. Nope. Did any of you guys have one um, type of incident that was happening more than 20% of the time that you were constantly writing kids up for? Nope. I said, so how many, you know, was it two, maybe five over the whole day? So that's mm -hmm. one per class period, not even one per class period. Um, so really the average was probably three kids mm -hmm. that they each had. Um, that was just, and those were the ones that they were toiling over. Like, oh, this is making this class Slim, so terrible. That ruined their whole day. Right? That ruined their whole day. Yeah. And that was making them cloud. So I, we sat there and we said, okay, no, let's focus on the 80%. Mm -hmm. What are you doing right? Who are the kids that are doing what you're asking them to do? Who are the kids that are coming to you? Because I said, I said, there's somebody that has said something positive to you that said, thank you. That said, how are you today? Or can I come to your room instead of going somewhere else which you know mm -hmm. it has its own issues you know let's think about what it was and then slowly but surely every single one of my zero year teachers had something and some of them were not just little somethings some of them were super powerful like one of my first year teachers who has just been going through it with one of her classes had another teacher did an assignment where she asked students to write um, a thank you or a note to a teacher or a staff member who you think needs a hug. Mm. That was the, that was the assignment. And she had told me, Hey, Miss so-and-so got the biggest stack out of my classes of you need a hug mm -hmm. notes. And I said, did y'all give them to her? And she was like, yes, we gave them to her. So I went to the teacher and I said, how'd that make you feel? She was like, I had no idea that this many of them 
really wanted to be there, cared, were listening. Mm -hmm. And I said, and this is only, you know, week nine Mm -hmm. and you're getting that kind of stuff. I had another one who said that she's got kids and same thing. She's got a class that takes her through the ringer like everybody does. Mine was always six period. Um, Mm -hmm. And she was focusing on that. And she said, but, you know, I have this group of kids who come by every morning and ask if I'm having tutorials because they want to come in my classroom in the morning. And just work in my room. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's big. That is. That, that means the kids feel safe there. Mm-hmm. They know that you want them there. And they want to be with you. Like, outside of anything else, if you can create an environment for kids where they want to be with you, that's huge. Sorry. And so she was like, man. Um, so it, it was stuff like that. I said, always try to focus on the majority. Take it back, even when you're emotional, when you're upset, when mm-hmm. you're having one mm-hmm. of those days, mm-hmm. take it back and think about the 80% or more. And most of them ended up having higher than 80% mm-hmm. <laughs> that the, that were able to comply and be successful. Because um, it's not just about compliance. It's about being successful mm-hmm. in the system. Um, and so when you put it in those terms, um, they were able to say, okay, I can get through the bad days. Um, I also am very clear with them in my hiring um, you know, interview process and when school starts, there there will be rough days. There mm-hmm. will be children who just for whatever reason do not want to be um, compliant and do the work and, you know, that kind of stuff. Take care of yourself um, and understand that that child is going through something so that you don't take what's happening to you um, as a, as a, um, a direct hit on you. It's not personal. Um, and then that way that'll help you really see what's going on. Um, and eventually build that relationship with that kid. Um, I know both of us can talk about Mm -hmm. some of the kids that we have the strongest relationships with Mm -hmm. are the kids who took us through the ringer (laughs) at the beginning. Um, and we're just not gonna even acknowledge our existence. In Mm -hmm. my case, um, a couple of them didn't even want to just look my way. Mm -hmm. Um, and now they are the kids who come to me for everything. Um, and so I, I just told them, focus on building those relationships, look at the majority um, and not the minority, and then um, love them through their struggle um, as much as you can. Um, kind of the same uh, uh, advice for students, okay. especially adolescents, because that's my, my mm. wheelhouse is middle school and high school, is trying to help them see the big picture. Mm. It's not just seventh grade. It's not just eighth grade and letting them know that life does get better after that. I know now enough about the brain to understand that that's just how their brains work. It's all about right now. But um, I tell them, let's start working on some strategies to help you get through and over that emotional explosion Mm -hmm. um, that is happening in your brain. And um, I I try to be very clear on the expectations um, for them to come and see me and write or color or yell um, (laughs) or hit something if they need to Mm -hmm. um, because I'm going to help them through that as opposed to having an explosion in front of people who don't know them and don't understand their struggle. Um, So that for me is helping them build that strategy of instead of just completely reacting as soon as that that lid flips, Mm -hmm. take a deep breath, say, can I go see Miss Brown? Or you know, if you have to just, just come start walking away Mm -hmm. from the situation. Um, and that came because I, like I said, I work with kids who are in trauma Mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I figured out that's where you really need to get them. You can't, and I don't want to stop them from having the emotion because they'll get, they're going to be hurt. They're going to be upset, but I want to help them figure out how to deal with it instead of hitting somebody Mm -hmm. or, you know, Mm -hmm. those kind of things. Um, so I just let them know that their feelings are valid, um, but the actions and reactions are where we need to put our exactly. thoughts. And that's good. That's something that, you know, I just talked about on my last episode, mm-hmm. talking about feelings are vital. Yeah. You know, so the emotions that people feel when they get hurt or when they're going through trauma, like you say, and a lot of, a lot of the students that we work with, right? So we work in the low, you know, income schools and at risk and all that. And so... They do go through traumatic situations. They do experience pain. They do experience hurt. They experience stuff that we may not even have no clue about. Okay, and so they come to school and they have to wear this mask. Yep. Right, they gotta wear this mask. And so then somebody you know makes them upset or ticks them off or something just triggers. And so I like what you said. You know, you said that their feelings, yeah, they're they're valid. Their feelings, what they're feeling, you know, it's 
they can feel that, but it's how you respond to that. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them don't know how to respond. A lot of adults don't know how to respond, right? So, so I'm with you on that. I'm big on that. In fact, you know, and that's one of the things as I was, you know, preparing for my podcast, the last one that I recorded was like, man, feelings aren't final. They're not, you know, because, you know, think about it. You know, there's times where, where we felt pain, we felt hurt, but all that eventually fades, yep. right? So it's kind of like, okay, now what? Now what? Not why, because we can get stuck in why, but now what? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's awesome that, that you, yeah. you know, take time to, to show the kids that yeah. because they need somebody. And if they're not getting at home, they need to get somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then, two for parents, um, talking to parents of teenagers, um, I let them know because a lot of times, you know, coming from elementary school, they're, you know, hand-holding and always there. And they think, oh, I'm in middle school now. I can let go. I've always encouraged my my parents of my middle school and my high school kids to actually hold on tighter um, when you get to middle school and high school. It may look a little bit different. Yeah, they don't need you to help them tie their shoes Mm -hmm. and cross the street. Mm -hmm. But they need, they're making big decisions Mm -hmm. um, about a lot of things every single day. And they need to know that they can trust you. Um, And parents... And I'm speaking, I'm a teenage parent now and it hurts some days. Mm-hmm. We have to be able to kind of get over the hurt feelings because mm-hmm. they're, they're, their brains are pushing us away. Mm-hmm. They tell you, I don't want to say anything. We've just got to stay the course. Um, and I don't mean be a hover and constantly ask the mm-hmm. kids, you know what, but just always let them know that you're there for them. Come to the school still, um, you know, contact us, um, ask about what they're supposed to be doing, what, you know, where, where they need to go. Um, and just you know, hang on to them, um, in a different way, um, Mm -hmm. when they, when they become adolescents and, and teenagers, because they still, this is when the the real stuff happens, For sure, you know, they're having their first, you know, love experiences. They're having their first experience, possibly working, you know, doing something that possibly could lead to getting them money, uh, you know, in the future, their, their course load is extremely, Mm -hmm. it's a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Um, their structure of their day looks (laughs) completely different when they get, um, to, to middle school. And, um, that's a lot going on all at once. And their brains are just firing a million, you know, times a minute and they can't always navigate Mm -hmm. correctly. And so they make bad choices sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, but they need us and parents to bookend them and help them understand, um, you know, how to make better choices next time. Um, I'm also very big on not holding a grudge against a child Mm -hmm. for a decision that they have made. Um, you know, every they're, they're still learning. Mm -hmm. So we have to give them chances. I wake up every day knowing that I'm probably going to say walk Mm -hmm. (laughs) a million times in the hallway. People are like, well, won't they ever stop running? No, Mm -hmm. that's what kids do. Mm -hmm. So every day I know I'm going to say walk, walk, walk so that at least when they see me or when they get in the hallway, they might at least start running. But then, okay, no, I know I'm not supposed to be running. Exactly. And eventually they'll get it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it, you you have to repeat yourself. Um, it, it's, it's the same with anything. I gave the example to um, one of my teacher friends the other day that I was talking to. Um, when we're teaching our children how to walk, um, we don't just show them one time. And then put them on the floor and walk away and say walk Mm -hmm. and never go back and try to help and, you know, help them along. We show, you know, they're learning how to walk. They see us modeling walking. They're trying. We're encouraging them. Everybody has a video of them trying to encourage their child to take their first step. And then even after they take their first step, we make sure they fall, but we help (laughs) them up. But we we have guardrails. We have protection on corners. Mm -hmm. Why don't we do that in the education system? Why do we think that we can teach something one time? And the kids are going to be able to master it. Mm -hmm. And then we get mad or upset with the kids and with the system and with the administration because all of this kind of stuff. But we know that that's not how the brain learns. So why do we change it from when they're learning how to walk to when we're trying to teach them how to solve a a quadratic equation? Mm -hmm. I I don't I've never been able to to separate the two. Mm -hmm. Teaching them how to walk is super complicated. So is solving a quadratic equation. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to start slow and protect them along the way and teach them until they've practiced it enough to be running. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know if that digressed a little no, bit. No, but, that's, that's good stuff. No, I mean, <laughs> but it's kind of, yeah, yeah, one of my philosophies on, on education and the education system and um, how we need to work within it so that kids can 
succeed. So let's talk about the greatest leadership tip you could give someone. So let's say somebody wants to go into administration, you know, they're a teacher now, they've been teaching five, 10, 15 years, and now they think they're ready to make this job. What's the number one leadership tip you would give them? Mm. The, start by um, observing and learning. Um, observe your um, everything in your campus. So if you go from being a teacher to an administrator um, at a different campus um, or even at a new campus, l observe everything from multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, Go into a classroom, sit in the desk, get so you get your your student perspective. Um, go get your and this is gonna you know one of those things. Go get your janitorial perspective. Mm -hmm. Go get your custo I mean your uh, cafeteria worker mm -hmm. perspective. Go into your special needs classrooms. Mm -hmm. Go into your GT classrooms. Um, go see extracurricular events um, so that you can get a full picture of your whole campus. Um, then learn, learn your people. Um, the first year as an administrator, I got some great advice. Don't come in and change anything unless mm -hmm. it's affecting safety and security mm -hmm. um, on your campus. But just go in and learn how they do things. Learn who does what, because mm -hmm. um, that's huge for a campus. Mm -hmm. Who are your leaders? Um, and then learn the people. Learn if you have a staff that is um been at that campus since it opened mm -hmm. learn if you have a you know staff that's fairly new learn if you have a staff that um have you know just recently been married or recent college graduates or you know who have gone through the loss of parents and who have you know learn about the people that you're working with um so that that can inform your conversations with them okay. um excuse me uh we're in the people business and you'd be crazy if you thought none of that outside stuff affects what's going on in the classroom. It does. <laughs> it, it, does. does. It, really does. it does for the kids <clears throat> and for the for your staff. That's right. Um, and so just by knowing some of that, mm -hmm. th those things, you can help them through that. But then you can also ensure that the campus still runs. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I always tell people is personal stuff happens. People are going to be late. Kids are going to get sick. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to go do something or, you know, that. But you've got to let us know that mm -hmm. so that I can make sure that this place is taken care of so that you can take care of yourself while you're away. That's right. Um, one of the things that kills me is when teachers say, I'm just going to come to school sick because I I'm nervous about what's going to happen mm -hmm. or I don't think my kids or I don't have, you know, I don't want y'all to have to deal with it if my sub drops or mm -hmm. something like that. I always tell them, no, you need to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. We, th this is what we do. Mm -hmm. We'll take care of this as long as we know and we understand what's happening. Um, and so definitely, um, observe your, your surroundings and get multiple perspectives, um, and then learn your people. Those, those are two for me. That's good. Yeah. See, again, there it is. There's a theme again. <laughs> it's all about relationships. Yeah. All right. So here we go for the last question. All right. I, I love this question. By the way, this is a question. All right. This is a question that I would ask in interviews uh -huh. and it would always, you know, most of the time, majority of the time it would stump people because they're like, what? Because, so the question is this, before you ask it, the question is, what is one thing that you would never want to do as an educator and why? Because yeah. most of the times you say, well, what do you want to do as an educator? And you're like, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that. And that's easy. But when you flip it, right, yeah. what is something that you would never want to do as an educator and why? And again, before you answer that, you know, one of the thing, things that I stress, you know, on this podcast is that, man, if you have somebody who's looking up to you, you're an educator. If you're a teacher, you're an educator. A parent, you're an educator. You work with young people at church, you're an educator. In fact, I got a message today from a student who goes to UT. And he's a pledge master. Okay, so he's a pledge master for his fraternity. And he was like, you know what? He's like, thank you so much for telling me that I'm an educator. He's like, I am. He's like, there are these, you know, you know, these guys who are new in my frat, and I'm their pledge master. So I'm their educator. I'm their leader. I'm their influence. I'm the person that's influencing them. So again, if you're listening out there, don't. Don't discount this information because if you have somebody who's looking up to you, who's going to you for advice, you're an educator. So 
That's yeah. phenomenal. You like that? I do right, like that. Go. Good job, <laughs> right, So, What is one thing you would never want to do as an educator and why? So I, when I was preparing, it was it was one of those questions that you're like, what? Um, and so at first, the first thing that came to my head was besides textbooks. Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> so the, the, the thing behind textbooks, I, that is the one thing that as an administrator, I have never done okay. because I don't want to do it. Yeah. But I, and I've actually traded things that other people would be like what i've traded summer school okay. for textbooks but so other than textbooks um, or drive a bus okay. those are the okay. other things that driving these children around terrifies me because okay. because of, i want to keep them safe but um the more deep answer the more the real answer is i would never want to negatively impact a student's life long term um and i really do lose sleep over that mm-hmm. when i make a decision um because a lot of the decisions that we end up making do or can um, send kids into a certain path Mm -hmm. down the, down the road. And I'll tell a quick story at the end about why um, I I, I put this because something happened to me as a student, but I would never want to do something that negatively impacts a kid. Okay. Um, And so one of the pieces of advice that I've given young administrators and leaders is to always be able to be convicted behind your decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, Every decision that you make, you have to be able to reconcile it with yourself and know that you made that decision for whatever greater good reason, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, and you need to be able to articulate that. That's how you'll be able to sleep at night. If you ever make a decision that you're not convict- convicted behind or that you really, oh, I'm not really sure why I did that mm-hmm. or I think that might have hurt a kid or that wasn't the right decision. That's good. And, and it's not about right or wrong. It just wasn't the right decision mm-hmm. for you. Um, and so when I say negatively impact, um, I had a teacher in junior high who um, was my eighth grade English teacher. And you know how it is in the spring, you have to go around and you're picking your classes for high school mm-hmm. and for just just like now for honors or pre-AP classes, mm-hmm. um, you have to have a recommendation from your teacher mm-hmm. um, to be able to go into those classes seemingly. Um, and so I remember going to my eighth grade English teacher and asking him to sign off on my honors English for high school. And he told me he was not going to sign it. Wow. And I, yeah, this was you yeah (laughs) 13 year old me so like i said before i was never the top top kid but i was always a solid kid like i worked hard i made a's mostly some b's whatever um and i i didn't understand why and so i remember asking him what because i didn't you know i've never been told no like that before and he was like well i see that you have spanish circled also well yeah because i need a foreign language he was like i don't think that you're you'll be able to do both of those wow yeah. Just shutting you out like that. Man. Uh, and so I thought, and that that might too, even though I didn't want to be a teacher when I went to college, I've always remembered that. And so when I started working with the kids at TJ Rusk, I was like, I never want to speak anything but life into right. kids. Now, not that all kids can do some everything, yeah. because we know there are some people who couldn't yeah. handle it, but he didn't give me a reason. Yeah. It was just, I don't think you can. You know me well, and a lot of people know me well enough now. Like, I'm like, oh, you say I can't? That's a challenge. Huh. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Exactly. Yeah, and so guess exactly. what? I went around it, got mom involved, got all this stuff, ended up being in honors English, ended up being in honors and AP, ended up taking through Spanish 5 in high school mm-hmm. also, taking Spanish in college yeah. as well. Um, and yeah, like she, I said, she speaks a little Spanish. Too. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you only think of Espanol. Um, but I just, um, I never want to be that person yeah, for good. a kid. Like that and breaks my heart. And here's a great lesson in that because you obviously had parents who were involved mm-hmm. and who fought for you. Right? Mm-hmm. And you had the, you had the type of mentality like, okay, you're going to say no to me. Well, let me show you differently. But let's think about the kids who don't have the mentality or don't have the mom and dad that's going to fight for them. And you know how it is because specifically in low-income schools, yeah, we don't have those parents. They're like, oh, well, they said no, they said no. Yes. And so that's where we become advocates as well. So not only are we assistant principals, administrators, principals, we're also advocates that say, hey, no, we're going to fight for this kid. No, you need to be an honors. No, I believe you can be an honors. Whether your mom believes that, whether your grandpa believes that, I believe that. Man. That's good. So Yeah. That's awesome. So you listen to that again. You never just want to negatively impact. And maybe, and here's the thing, right? So in hindsight, right? Let's just play devil's advocate. In hindsight, maybe he he didn't even need 
the teacher didn't mean any harm by it, but mm-hmm. still. But right? still. And maybe he did. We don't know. I don't know. I mean, do you know? Do you think he meant it? I, I remember just being in shock. Okay. I don't remember ever having a, a bad relationship with that, so with that just, teacher. So whatever, you know, maybe whatever, he had just yeah. this, you know, what they call it in sociology, right? This implicit bias, right? So for whatever reason, whatever implicit reason. bias, you know, where there's this, you know, African-American, mm-hmm. 13-year-old girl who, mm-hmm. you know what? She can't do both, okay? For whatever reason. Yeah. He has some sort of bias that made that prejudgment on you. Yeah. So again, that, that's good. Negatively want to impact somebody's life. Yeah, you know, that's good. yeah. All right. That's, that's me. So. Well, hey, it's been great. Is that enjoyed it? it? Yeah, that's going to be it. it. We made it. We made it. We made it. So hey. uh, anything you want to plug? Anything? Uh, I know you, you, your son, right? He takes pictures he and stuff. Does. Come on, you can plug. And I can? Big, yeah, go ahead and plug oh, his, his Instagram and they can follow yes. him or whatever. Yeah. So my son, who is also a struggling learner, so on the parent side, I have dealt with, with dealing with that too. He is a phenomenal photographer, um, sports photography um, and he has been working with a couple of people, um, uh, coaches in the area and has some sideline game, like nobody's business on these pictures. Um, he has an Instagram at QB dot photos, um, on Instagram. He will come work for you if you have sports pictures that you want to take, um, or if you want to buy some of the ones that he has, um, but he is killing it, man. And that's what he wants to do. He's a junior. So we're starting to work on that college Ooh, yeah, entrance awesome. stuff. All yeah. Right. Well, how about you? Where can people follow you? So you can follow me um, at Reflection1913 on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, I put a whole bunch of stuff, lifestyle stuff out there, positive stuff, a lot of education um, information. That's where I get a lot of my stuff from. And um, so I would appreciate it if you would come check me out. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for... You're actually... I know I said you're the first person I interviewed, but... Isabella took that on yesterday. <laughs> yeah, we, we were we were trying out this you know this new this new equipment. So you know, interviewed her first, but you're my official yeah. first. Hey, but interview. I just want to say thank you. Um, I was a little bit nervous, but I'm very excited because, um, like I said too, I'm trying to get into more of the consulting role and training and facilitation role, and so. Um, putting, well, you got it. Putting in my you. voice, and I know out you there. know that, but I just want to tell you that as you were just expressing. It, you know, and that's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this, you know, this um, just interview people, because, you know, the greatest thing that we every individual has is their story and every story. Every story is different. So there's things that you have, there's knowledge that you have, there's wisdom that you have, there's expertise that you have that, you know, again, let's go back to what we said. I'm not going to be able to impact, you know, all these people, but you may. Right. And so if I can spark that and say, hey, listen to what you just said, play this back. And like, man, you got nuggets there that you can just give off to people. Yeah. So I yeah. hope, you know, it encouraged me listening to you. And I hope it encourages you Thanks. as well as you go on with your, you know, your consulting and all that. So yeah. I got you back. I appreciate it. Hey, and I, I too, I believe in ordered steps. So there was a reason that you got called last That's October. Right. That's right. Because sure. look at us now. We're exactly. best. We're BFFs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's TBD. <laughs> I'm say, yeah, no, no, we're good. We're familia. <laughs> right, well, thank you yeah. so much. So. Appreciate you. All right, that wraps up the interview with Rachel Brown. And now for the special surprise, it's a quick interview with Isabella Cristales. Thank you so much for joining me on the Mission Driven Podcast. My name is AC Cristales, and today I'm joined by a special, 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 special guest. And her name is? Isabella. What's your last name, Isabella? Cristales. Cristales. All right, so I have I have one question for you, Isabella. All right, so... Um, one of the things that I talk about, okay, and I know you're looking at me like really weird, you're like, why are you talking to me like that? But anyways, so one of the things that I, that I talk about on this podcast is um, just the power that teachers have and educators have. So can you tell the audience who your favorite teacher ever has been? Mm, my fourth grade teacher. Okay, so your fourth grade teacher, all right. Do you want to give us your fourth grade teacher's name? Just in case she's listening, you never know, she may be listening. Miss Topper. Miss Topper, okay. Is that her name, Miss Topper? Was that her name last year? Well, she got married. She got married. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, Miss Topper, and her late name last year was Miss Fenera. Uh, Miss Fenera. Hi. Right, very good. So, Isabella, tell us why Miss Fenera or Miss Topper now is your favorite teacher. She helped me love animals more. She helped you love animals more. How does she do that? She kept on telling us stories of her husband saving animals. Oh, really? Cool. So when she was telling you those stories, how'd that make you feel? 
I want more pets. You want more pets? All right, very good. Is there a specific pet that you want? A tortoise. A tortoise? All right. Why, why do you want a tortoise? Because um, it was like um, one of the, she has a lot of them in her classroom and I just like them more. You just like them more? All right, very good. Is there a specific tortoise that you like? Do you know what's um, the name of the tortoise that you like in the class? Herman. Herman. All right, Herman the tortoise. All right, very good. So, so you liked her because she taught you about animals. Was she nice? Was she a nice teacher? Yes. Could you tell that she cared about you? Mm -hmm. How do you know she cared about you? Mm, um, I don't know. You don't know, but you just knew she cared about you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Was she? Was she? Uh, did she have a good attitude all the time? Yes. Was she helpful? Yes. Was she caring? Yes. All right, very good. Well, Isabella, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for being my first guest. I really appreciate it, all right? Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to tell the, the audience out there? Mm -mm. Nah? All right, thank you, baby. Thank you guys for listening to this episode. I hope it encouraged you. I hope it empowered you. I hope you were able to take something with you that will be fuel for your week, all right? And as always, remember this, okay? If you're listening on iTunes, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Make sure to rate and review it as well. Or if you're listening on Spotify, there's that follow button. Go ahead and click on it. Or if you're on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel because the podcast that I record and that I upload also get uploaded to YouTube. So you can listen on there as well. Continue to spread the message. Continue to tell your friends and your family, yo, you got to check out this podcast, the Mission Driven Podcast. It's going to encourage you. It's going to empower you you're gonna get something from it thank you guys for listening i can't wait to next week when i break down well i'm not gonna tell you right now but next week i'm looking forward to it as well so remember the mission is now so remain mission driven faith hope love